we are going to jump into a fireside chat with one of my new favorite people in the whole wide world. Her name is Nikki Reed. Um, you know her best as an actress and writer. She is also an amazing entrepreneur um, in the sustainable space, which is something I'm personally passionate about. She started her company um, from Bayou with Love um, back in 2017. It's a sustainable lifestyle company um, and it supports local artisans and craftsmen um, and ethical factories. Um, and Nikki is also an amazing animal rights activist, um, rescuing dogs um, right now, actually, during the pandemic, which I think is awesome. So we, we have lots to talk about, and I want to jump right in. Are you there, Nikki? Hi. Hi. Welcome. How are you? Thanks for that sweet intro. No problem. I love that plant in your background. It's giving me life. <laughs> Right. It's this plant has gotten a lot of really good use out of it during this pandemic, right? We need something to create a little background color. I love how you have a real plant and I have a fake plant behind me for this way. <laughs> um, awesome. But thanks for joining us today. Um, you know, our audience, um, our community, <clears throat> they're all creators, small business owners. Um, and obviously during this pandemic, it's been such a wild year. And I think Everybody's been impacted, um, you know, both positively and negatively. So my first question for you is like, how has it been for you as an entrepreneur this year? What challenges have you faced and what changes have you had to make? Hmm. You know, I think that during this, I don't know what we should call it, except really like this giant pause that we're all experiencing. I think there's also been a lot of forward momentum too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's a moment in time for for business owners, especially our creators, um, whatever, you know, however you create, uh, whether that's content or fashion or, you know, what you choose to write about, how you choose to see the world, whatever you're doing and creating, I think it's a nice moment for everybody. Maybe nice is not the right word. Let me just, <laughs> <laughs> but it's an appropriate moment for all of us to think about how we're um, how we're operating, how we're conducting business, what we're choosing to spend our time and energy and uh, resources on and what we're presenting to the world, what we're researching. Um, so I've noticed, you know, even though we are a sustainable company and the whole reason behind Bayou, the mission behind Bayou. Yes, it's of course to create um, beautiful products, but at the end of the day, it's about creating products that are also as beautiful in their message as they are in their mission. Sorry, I have a lot of animals around. Um, oh, and so, she's making her debut. Oh, <laughs> and so, another wow. little rescue kitty. Um, and so I think it's been um, a really great moment to dive even further into that for me as a business owner, because at the end of the day, sustainability isn't really enough. At this point, you know, we've really depleted uh, Earth of Mother Earth of all of her natural resources to the to the point of, um, you know, we really need the pendulum to swing the other way and we need to regenerate and replenish and kind of go to another version of extreme. So neutral, neutrality, uh, sustainability, all of that kind of isn't enough anymore. Um, we need to really replenish and regenerate. So as a business, I've been focusing heavily during this time on how to create um, regenerative products uh, in this space. You know, the fashion industry is undoubtedly one of the most destructive industries in the world. And so it's time for all of us to really um, take five steps forward instead of just one step at a time. Awesome. Um, and what inspired you to create Bayou with Love? Like, obviously you're invested in sustainability, but was there a certain shift in your life um, when it comes to, you know, just how you live and how you consume or has this been a lifelong thing for you? I get asked that question a lot, like what was the moment? Um, you know, there wasn't really a moment. I can't recall a moment. It's like asking, me like when did you fall in love with animals you know I, I i can just say like i remember being a child and you know and rescuing a lot of animals but i can't pinpoint like the moment that that bled into the rest of my life um and i think sustainability is uh you know i have a similar uh answer and relationship to that which is you know everything is actually connected so you learn a little bit about something and it leads you into the next area and the next door opens and then you're on the next path and it probably all started with animal activism, to be honest with you, because 
my love for animals, I think, brought me into this space of, well, then um, I'm I'm not going to eat them anymore. <laughs> and so plant-based living and healthy living, um, I think, kind of moved me into, okay, so what are we doing in the agriculture space to our planet? And in the food space in general, you know, if we want to talk about, um, I think, a real passion area for me, which I don't I don't talk about too much, but I think I'm. I need to start um, exploring this in a more uh, uh, conversational way, which is, you know, the plant-based movement, which is so amazing. You know, I love hearing about people being, you know, more conscious of what they're consuming. But the plant-based movement has also brought us into a space of terrible consumption habits. I mean, mm -hmm. just because you're not eating animals doesn't mean that the marketplace isn't capitalizing on the desire to eat plant-based and everything coming in plastic and packaging and preservatives. And, you know, it's so like, I try to stay in the positive, so I don't want to go dark right now, but it's so sad to me to realize that once we kind of start to get it as human beings, it feels like the marketplace really does take advantage of that. And they go like, okay, how do we monetize that? And, you know, the plant-based movement is one of them. Like now you see everybody needs to have like protein shakes and protein bars and how many more things can we buy that just sit in our pantry and not in our refrigerator? No one's talking about, I mean, people are talking about growing food, but I mean, in that marketplace, we're not teaching people how to farm. We're teaching people how to purchase more, you know? And I think that is definitely something that's like, uh, frustrating to see and, and witness. But anyway, so it started with animals and then moved into probably plant-based eating and then moved into the environment. And then you kind of just realize the interconnectedness between all of it. I mean, whatever your passion is, if you're an activist in any form, you realize it's connected to everything else. It's not really a singular passion, you know? Right. So it seems like it was like the journey is really organic for you and it continues to be, which is awesome. Um, I think Honestly, every industry is male dominated in a sense. Um, but were there any specific challenges that you faced as a woman, um, a woman in the sustainability space when it when it came to starting your business? Sometimes I wake up and I feel like there's so much progress that's been made that it's like, why are we even focusing on this? We just need to be focusing on what we're doing and building amazing companies as women and not focus on the, you know, the polarization and s separation. And then other days I wake up and I am really frustrated at, you know, mm -hmm. the obstacles and challenges that I do feel like I face as a woman. I mean, here's the thing. I think great to focus on that. But I think for me personally, I want to focus my energy into just creating those opportunities for other women, watching Bayou succeed and finding ways to succeed in every way that I can, whatever that definition of success is, by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean, and we can talk about this in a minute, but I want Bayou to stay a small business. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there's tremendous success in small business. Um, but anyway, I feel like if we just create those opportunities for other women and we don't get too stuck on the whys and hows in the past, yeah, we have to change the infrastructure from the ground up. But we can also do that as successful, badass business owners um, and not get in our own way by um, putting too much of our energy into the why is it this way. Um, I can tell you that, you know, with Bayou, not only being a woman, but also trying to create uh, in a way that had never been done before. You know, I was creating products out of recycled gold found in recovered technology and the extraction process and then bringing that gold to the factory. I was having conversations with, you know, our, our manufacturers, like they were going, hey, so how are we going to receive this gold? Like, does it come mm -hmm. in pellets or trays or what are you doing delivering gold in this way? Normally the process, and I don't want to bore you with this, but the way this works is when you create jewelry, you you create a product and then you purchase that gold from your factory and then they bill you for the cost of that gold into each piece. Well, if I'm providing the gold, then we have to account for A, who's taking care of that gold and watching it, also gold loss and keeping track of by the gram every single gram of gold that goes into each piece and weighing out every single piece to account for that gold. So there's obviously tremendous gold loss and opportunities for this to not be a, uh, an efficient business model. And so I, you know, I have to be very on top of it. And it, a lot of times within the Bayou house, we're all women currently. Actually, that's not true. We do have one um, one man who's 
working in the Bayou world, but we're uh, mostly women. But in the jewelry industry as a whole, you know, I feel like I'm speaking to a lot of men all the time. And sometimes you feel like you have to like hold your own and like walk into a room and talk to, you know, a, a table full of men about something that, you know, they've maybe been been doing this for decades and this is a family, you know, family owned business or something like that. And here I am coming in, you mm -hmm. know, a newcomer in this industry um, with a ton of kind of disruptive ideas in a sense, you know, because we're talking sustainability. So anyway. Yeah, that's cool. I love the amount of care that goes into sustainable products. Um, but at the same time, like you just said, it can be, you know, just challenging to balance it all and to keep up and to make sure all the boxes are being checked off. So like, kudos to you. Um, I'm like, I don't, could I do that? I don't know. Yes, you can. Um, yes, you can. I can, I can. Positive affirmation. Um, my next question, going back to what you briefly um, said before about wanting to stay a small business, what are your reasons for that? And I guess what what exactly does that mean? What does that look like in terms of your business? Um, well, the reason I say that is because, A, you know, I'm working in a space where um, there – so Bayou – like I said before, we're we're a mission-driven company. Now, of course, you have to create products that appeal to people because at the end of the day, people want to spend their money on something to have that they feel connected to. And, you know, a lot of times that starts on, on a superficial level. It's got to be a beautiful product. Um, one of the reasons I love working in the jewelry space is because we're creating products that are treasures and family heirlooms and get passed down from generation to generation. I mean, it's very, very unlikely that you'll find a, you know, a diamond ring tossed into a landfill, you know, it's, it's an asset. And so it's passed around. And I think if we could adopt that model in all areas of fashion, um, we would see a lot, a lot, obviously a lot less waste, but a lot, um, you know, the, like, a, a circular model for fashion is really the only way forward. Um, and the reason I want to stay a small business is because I feel I already have experienced in the small amount of growth that we have had, that the second you start producing on a mass scale, you have to inevitably compromise on what your your mm. morals are as a company. And to a certain extent, I think you have to detach a little bit from like, you know, we, our checklist was very long, right? We, we want everything to be uh, sustainable, ethical, consciously sourced, organic, if we're talking clothing space, locally produced, upcycled, recycled, you know, the list is long. And there are areas where you have to sometimes compromise. For example, we're currently researching um, and exploring the idea of splitting some of our production and yes, keeping the majority of it local in Los Angeles, but then moving a portion of production to a different factory that specializes in some of the pieces that we want to create next. And maybe I can't produce every single thing in California forever. I'm not sure, but I'm exploring it right now. That's one area that maybe you compromise because you found a factory that let's say will also work with your recycled gold and produce in the way that, you know, what your standards are. Okay, great. One area to compromise. But when it comes to like, for example, you know, greenwashing and, you know, taking a business that was initially in its heart, you know, truly sustainable with all the right goals. And then you watch as these companies grow and suddenly you hear from the founders like, oh, once, you know, once it took off and it wasn't in my hands anymore, it became a totally different beast, you know, and I just don't want to see that happen to buy you. It's too personal for me. The company is, I, I recognize that there are really difficult challenges that we face trying to produce the way that I intend to keep producing. Um, but I also think that I have a moral responsibility as a business owner and somebody who started this with my own heart and soul and personal um, moral compass invested. I feel like I have a responsibility to continue on that path and not stray because there are other ways that are more profitable. Yeah, of course, you know, of course, we all want to have a profitable company. In fact, the company can't continue if it's not profitable. So we need to figure out that balance. Um, but I do think that there's a way to do both. And I like staying small. Like to me, I think we're already at 35% of our end goal growth. 
Awesome. So it sounds like, especially for those of you out there, if you are building a mission-based company, like these are things you, you want to think about as you continue to grow. Like, how do I make sure I'm not compromising, but also how do I make a profit and sort of like finding that balance there. I think that's really, really great advice. Yeah, the problem is, is, a, is a tough conversation to have because most people, myself included, you know, before Bayou, just simply aren't educated on what it means to create a product, what steps you have to go through to create that product and then get it into the hands of consumers and why profit margins look the way they do. Before I started Bayou, I didn't even understand what a wholesale margin was. You know, when I was going through margins, I was like, what do you mean we have to create? What does a two markup mean versus a four markup? Like none of that. I didn't even know that language. And now, you know, the reason why we're a direct to consumer business and we don't have a wholesale margin built in. So for those of you who, who don't know, basically you create a product, let's say that product is $5 to create your wholesale margin is two times that. And then your retail margin is four times that. Those are loose figures, but that's basically what it is. And that's so that you can sell at that middle ground to third party retailers, whoever that is for, you know, fashion, if that's your, your Barney's or your Nordstrom's or whatever. And you still as a company need to make a small profit. So you have a wholesale margin built in. Well, we can't have a wholesale margin built in because I'm producing in the US, which is so much more costly than producing overseas. I mean, astronomically higher. You know, we're talking the difference between 12 cents to set a diamond in China versus $4, sometimes $8 to set that one stone. So if you're looking at a ring, let's say like, you know, a ring like this that has diamonds all the way around, Pave diamonds, and you're talking about, you know, 50 stones, 50 stones at 12 cents a stone looks a lot different than 50 stones at four or $8 a stone. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a US based company, you know, when you try to explain that to the customer, and they're like, wait, you, you know, I'll never be able to compete with China prices, for example, I, I just won't. And so your customer either comes to you because they want to spend a little bit more because they believe in what you're creating, and they know that you're creating in the right way. Or they, um, you know, or that doesn't necessarily matter to them and they're just looking at price, but we'll never be able to compete with um, China prices. And the closest we can get is by staying a direct to consumer business and not having a wholesale margin built in. Um, and I don't know if this interests your audience at all, but um, a lot of people ask me uh, when they when they say I want to start a company, but they're like, I don't necessarily know what that company should be. So what do I do? Because I know I want to be a business owner. I know I'm passionate about, let's say this one area, um, whatever that is, but they don't know what that one thing is. And, you know, I used to think you needed to know what that one thing is to, to start your own company. But I have to say, Bayou actually started in a different area and we graduated into this. We found our place because of customer feedback. Um, I mean, I come from a, a family of jewelry designers. My oh, great cool. grandmother was a jewelry designer and then her daughter, my grandmother was an artist. And I started my first jewelry line actually when I was in my early twenties, it just was short lived because I wasn't necessarily ready. But Bayou actually started when we launched um, creating products that I couldn't find in the marketplace um, in the uh, skincare, beauty, apparel, multifunctional um, apparel and skincare space. And very quickly, we moved into jewelry when I got a phone call from Dell saying, hey, we know you work in sustainability, you create sustainable products, we have a really great idea, but we don't know what to do with it. We have gold that's been found in the motherboards of our recycled technology, but we don't have an idea for what this could be. Do you want a partner? And I was like, of course, I know what this could be. This is going to be, you know, recycled tech yeah. jewelry. And it really became our, our thing. And people were really seeking out Bayou because of that one thing. So we focused heavily in that space. And it, and it all fell into place the way it was supposed to. Yeah, so but naturally. People, you know, if you, like, if you have any kind of area of passion, anything that speaks to you, you know, you might decide tomorrow, like, I have a great idea to start this bread company. I want to make bread. And I feel like it could be, you know, like a gluten-free sprout, you know, yeast-free bread or whatever your idea is. And I want to sell it at farmer's markets. Great. Do that thing because you can get to that farmer's market and you can talk to people and have that direct customer relationship. And you might actually realize that your thing is not going to be bread. It's going to be creating the sustainable trade 
pray that you build loafs in and you end up making a bajillion dollars because that's your company. But I guess I would just say like, don't pause until you come up with the idea. Like just do. To start. I love yeah. that. And I think that's a perfect way to wrap this up. I so wish we could talk more because you're just giving the best advice and I'm soaking it all in. I'm sure everyone is too. Um, but I think we're going to leave it there. That's a great way to cap it off. Thank you so much, my fellow Nikki, for joining us. Hello, um, yes, I love that. Everyone, make sure you check out Body With Love. I'm obsessed with all the jewelry. I'm like, I need this, 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 and this. Um, I'm going to send you a treat. Don't Thanks. get me so excited, girl. Um, anyway, I'm gonna, we're going to jump off. Um, Jen Denton's going to jump on to um, introduce our next segment. Thanks again, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you.